not suggesting that it has to happen, but if it does happen, none, no one should be surprised, right? It Hello everyone. Today our special guest, Benjamin Cowan, talks about the Bitcoin bull support band and analyzes the prospective of a continuous Bitcoin bull run with regard to the halving year and historical Bitcoin charts data. Subscribe now, hit that bell icon, and embark on an enriching journey toward financial success. Let's unlock the potential of these markets together and pave the way for a brighter financial future. Welcome aboard. We talked about that, I, I believe, a, a, a week or two ago, that oftentimes after, after getting a, a string of seven or eight green weeks, you know, you will see, you know, you will see at least a pullback. Whether that it turns to something more than that, we'll have to see. But right now, the 20-week SMA is currently at around 32,400. The 21-week EMA is around 34,300. So pretty wide range, about about a $2,000 range there in terms of, of the spread on the 20-week SMA and the 21-week EMA. But what I like to look at is the extension from it. So we did get a pullback. So if you were to go look at, say, the, the short-term bubble risk on this, which is the extension from the 20-week moving average, we talked about this previously, you know, we first got that move up to the same extension that we got back in January and in February. That's where the extension went to in November. And then the extension above the 20 week that we just saw reached the same level that it was in March, right? So we pointed this out last week and we said, look, this is the same extension from the 20 week SMA that we reached back in March and we could be due for a pullback. And this past week, we at least did see Bitcoin pull back about five to 6%. Now I will say again, I mean, even if you pull up the, the short, if we pull up the short term bubble risk, even though the extension from the 20 week topped out on the week of March 13th, do note that while we did get a red week following that and then a couple of green weeks that went nowhere, we did finally get one last pop up before fading back down to the to the bull market support band, right? So we had a strong move up, red week, do nothing for a couple of weeks, and then another 7% move to the upside. Now, is it going to repeat in the same way? Probably not. I mean, this was a an eight-week stretch of green. This was just a single massive green candle. Um, you know, this candle here was about a 28% move. None of these candles over here were a 28% move, but you know, all in all, it was a much larger move than that. If you were to take it from where it began, it ended up being about a 64% move. But the point is that over here, it sort of just calmed down for about three weeks. We got one final pump. I'm trying to think about what that would look like this time. I mean, if it were to play out in the same way, probably won't, right? It probably won't play out the same way. But if it did, it would essentially mean... I guess the next couple of weeks flat, and then the first week of January getting one more pop, which could correspond to the uh, to the whole spot ETF stuff. But and a seven percent move higher from the current levels would would basically put you back at, at where we were previously, um, back at at around 44k. But it is it is an interesting chart to watch because we've we've seen sort of this extension from the 20-week moving average hit these key levels a couple of times here. Right, and you, you could actually extend this back all the way to 2021, and see that it almost lines up there as well, right? So like the extension in late 2021, that first pump got close to that same levels that we've been seeing over here, and then that second pump above the 20-week estimate that came in October, which also preceded the final high, right? It came in October, and then the final high was in November. This one came in in March, and then we had the final local top before going in sort of a summer lull where we didn't go anywhere. Same type of thing. Um, so interesting pattern to look at, to, especially to see if it if it ends up playing out uh, once again. But I mean, you can see that the last time we reached, you know, broader extension from the 20 week moving average where we were like 100% above the 20 week SMA, you'd have to go all the way back to late 2020 or early 2021. So it has been uh, quite a long time since that happened. And another way to visualize this is to is to look at the um, the price over the, the natural log of the price over the 20 week moving average. And and if you look at it like that, what you'll see is is, you know, sort of a, a nice trend line here that 
we talked about back in 2021 as marking a, a local top simply because that was kind of the, the, the trend line that we, have, that we had hit so many times in the prior bull markets. And going into the summer 2021, we had a video saying, all right, likely going to have a summer lull. We got to cool off from this thing. Now, some of you will ask, can we reach that same level here? Anything's possible. But do note, in the pre-having year of 2019, we were unable to reach it, right? It took another, it took another, you know, a year and a half or so before we reached that full extension. Um, and, and so in order to reach it, you know, Bitcoin would have to rally up a, a significant amount to get back above that level. And I mean, you can even see that the extension from the 20-week SMA measured this way, the natural log of the pressure for the 20-week SMA. I mean, you can see that it, it essentially topped out the, the extension from that 20-week moving average basically topped out at the same spot it did back in, in March. So interesting how, how, you know, while the prices are different, the levels, the extension from the 20-week have remained fairly constant in, in all of these moves so far. You know, it, it's also important to think about you know, 27K and, and 47 and a half K. They're also important confluence level, conf, confluence in, in other aspects as well. For instance, the 100-week SMA is right around 27, 28K, right? It's, that's where it is. And, you know, maybe, maybe that's not relevant to you, but it is notable that in, you know, at least the last, in the first part of the halving year, last cycle, we pulled back to the 100-week moving average, right? Just like we did in 2016 as well. And just like we did over here at the very end of the pre-halving year and sort of we took off from it in the early part of the halving year. Right, but in all cases, we sort of re we revisited that 100-week moving average late ha late pre-having year or early having year. I'm not suggesting that it has to happen, but if it does happen, none no one should be surprised, right? It, I'm not trying to say that anything has to happen, right? We have to be clear about that. Seasonality never has to happen. You know, we, we've covered seasonality on the channel a number of times, and it seems to work out about 70% of the time. The other 30% of the time, we talk about seasonality, it doesn't play out. And then and then people will be like, well, but you said, look, seasonality, it does not always happen. It just, it tends to happen. And so because it does tend to happen, it's important to, to consider that. It's the same thing when you think about the 20-week SMA, like the bull marks work band. Every single Q3 of every pre-having year, we've fallen below it, right? We fell below it here. We fell below it right here. This was Q3 of the pre-having year. Q3 of the pre-having year over here, we fell below it. And then again, this past year, Q3 of the pre-having year, we fell below it. And so, and a lot of people over here did not think we would, right? So you have to remember, I mean, it doesn't always play out, but oftentimes it does. And so there's that confluence at around that 27, 28K level, which also happens to correspond loosely with that prior, with these prior highs. It would be just below those prior highs. You know, so think about 31K. Imagine if we went below that, you went to 27, 28K. Um, that would correspond to the lower part of the regression band. And then the upper part of this regression band, which is around 47K, happens, coincidentally enough, to correspond to the 618. Right? If you take the, uh, the FIB retracement tool here and you go all the way up to the 618, that's exactly where that turns out to be, is right there at that regression band. And you might say, well, what's so special about the 618? Well, the reason it's relevant, at least loosely, is because if you take the extension, you know, if you look at the FIB retracement tool over here, you can see that that's exactly where Bitcoin rallied to was, in fact, the 618. And we also have to think about why did Bitcoin top out at the 618 over here? And does it have to top out at the 618 here? No, no guarantee we make it there. And no guarantee that if we do make it there, it stops there. But the reason why it's interesting to think about is if you look at interest rates, Bitcoin topped out just before the Fed started to cut rates, right? And it's almost like, could that happen again, right? I mean, you can see that it went to the top of this regression band just before the Fed started to cut. So, well, you know, is it, are we going to see something similar play out where it goes to the top of that regression band just before the Fed starts to cut? Or maybe the Fed start, or maybe maybe it doesn't make it there. But if it does make it up there to that 47, 48k level, and again, you know, we were I was talking about this um, 
uh, talking about this the other day on the on the no shell zone with with Gareth, and you know he's saying well, like a lot of people are calling for it, so maybe it won't actually happen. I don't know, right? I, I really don't know if we'll if we'll make it that high or not. As I previously said, my expectations have already been exceeded this year because I I, I was sort of thinking, you know, 35k would would sort of mark the limits for Bitcoin this year, um, but we we've exceeded that and. I've learned in the past when it exceeds your limits, like, you know, it's, it's kind of foolish to just move the goalpost, just kind of get out of the way and, and let it go however high it's going to go. But just looking for, you know, for, for areas that have been, you know, resistance levels in the past and, and, and various confluence, um, and, and that's what we look for, right? So the upper part of the regression band happens to correspond to the 618. And, um, and so if we do make it there, it would be important to think about where are we in terms of rate cuts? Are we starting to see those rate cuts come in just like we did you know, about four years ago? And if we don't make it there or if we pull back down, do we go back to the 100 week moving average, which is exactly where we pulled back to right here in late December of the pre-having year, early part of the having year. That's where we pulled back to. Now, over there, we ended up getting a recession, we got a hard landing, and we went a full regression band below that, right? So if we were to go a full regression band below this, it would mean going all the way down here, right? If you, if you draw a line right here across the page, that's where it would correspond to basically the prior lows. So it all really depends on, on if we get a hard landing or not. And that depends on if the Fed starts to cut sooner rather than later. Because, again, you know, a lot of people are celebrating a soft landing and saying that, you know, the Fed's accomplished everything they needed to and, and inflation is where it needs to is heading where it needs to be. But this is the riskiest time. Like we're entering into the riskiest time where we could see the uninversion of the yield curve as the Fed starts to cut. But you have to wonder, why is the Fed cutting? Maybe they're cutting to get ahead of all the lag effects from all the rate hikes that we just had for the last two years. So that should be the narrative. That will likely be the narrative in 2024. Are people worrying about rate cuts as potentially the economy starts to finally slow down after, after two years of tighter monetary policy? And if they achieve, you know, if they, if they achieve a soft landing, then you could see something like this where we essentially hold the 100-week moving average as support, like in 2016, or if they've gone too far, you could get a hard landing where you go back to the 100 week moving average and everyone hopes that it holds that support. And then just kidding, hard landing arrives, recession rises, the unemployment rate goes north of 4%, the SOM rule triggers and all that other good stuff. And then you get a hard landing down to the lower regression band, right? And then you get sort of your, your, your retest just like you got over here. So it really, I mean, it really all, all comes down to, I, a lot of it comes down to, to that. And, and how quickly are, 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 is the Fed able to get things under control? So, I mean, I, for, for me right now, I think the bigger risk is, is rapid disinflation over the reacceleration of inflation at this point. And I think that should be abundantly clear in the nature of the bond market recently. The bond market continues to show strength despite the, the, despite the advertised pivot by the Federal Reserve, suggesting that the bond market is more concerned about disinflation and the economy slowing down than it is about inflation reaccelerating, at least in the short term. That doesn't mean that inflation can't reaccelerate, you know, a year from now or, or later on. But I think in the short term, the market is rightfully considered uh, or more worried about about disinflation leading to potential deflation. And it's all right. We've already seen some deflation in some categories uh, than it is anything else. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Ben Cowan. If you enjoy this highlight video, Please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.